Now, it takes a great pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker for the session which we have today, uh, who is Dr. Anirban Chakraborty. And I had the pleasure of meeting him in person as well as studying from him uh, for the zebrafish models uh, a few years ago. So uh, I know that you will all be benefited out of his speech, uh, which he's going to give today. Uh, let me give a brief overview of uh, his CV so that with that, we can proceed with this talk. Uh, sir is the professor and director of uh, NUKSA, uh, which is the University of uh, Science and uh, Education and Research. So he has uh, completed his MSc Microbiology from the University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore in the year of 1999. He completed his uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Molecular Biology from uh, United Graduate School of Agricultural Sciences, Kagoshima University, Japan, in the year of 2006. Uh, he has uh, held various positions in uh, research as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, in Japan and senior research associate in France. Uh, he joined uh, Nite University Center for Science Education and Research Bangalore at the year of uh, 2014 as associate professor. And uh, he has began his uh, 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 career there and then he has been now promoted to the director of that institution. Uh, he has various awards to his uh, uh, forte and he has, he has received the best researcher in, uh, of uh, Nuxar in the year of 2018. He had got the Career Research Award from the DST. Government of India 2016. He has received various international awards as well. Uh, he has got the Strategic Priority as Research Award by the University of Miyazaki Faculty of Medicine, Japan. Postdoctoral Fellowship, Dr. Zingan uh, Award from Best Overseas Indian PhD Student Thesis Award, the year of 2016. Uh, he is also a various uh, uh, a member, a life member of different associations uh, over, uh, across the globe. Uh, with this brief intro, uh, uh, his CV is quite a bit long. If you see, is a lot of accomplishments in terms of his grants as well as his uh, uh, research portfolio. Uh, I had the pleasure to see his, all his research grants, which I received in pros and crows of money. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, hear Sir's speech now. Uh, I welcome you, Sir, to begin your first speech, that is the uh, zebra fish in trans trans. Over to you, Sir. Thanks, Sir, yes, sir. for uh, helping me out. Uh, so uh, I was talking about, Akshat, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so the name zebrafish is basically from um, its, uh, the blue stripes that is uh, present on its body uh, compared to zebrafish, uh, compared to zebra, uh, the stripes are horizontal in nature. So uh, that's how the name comes from. They belong to the largest family of fish. One of the important features of zebra fish is that they can regenerate their skins, um, the, 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 the skin, the fins, and the heart. So it's a wonderful model system for um, you know, uh, regenerative medicine as well. A little bit about their lifespan and habitat. Uh, they usually grow up to um, four to five centimeter. Um, lifespan is generally, they are two to three years. Uh, in the labs, they, you can keep them alive for two to three years, but in the world, they can they can be alive for about five to six years also. Uh, originally a fish from India and the adjoining uh, countries. You can find them a very hardy species. You find them in streams, in canals, in rice fields, um, in, in Southeast Asian countries. More generally, uh, we, we find a lot of them in India. In fact, uh, we have uh, the Indian strain, which has been sequenced now from IGIB in New Delhi. They have sequenced the Indian strain, which is uh, different from uh, the standard uh, the Tübingen and the AB strain that originated from Germany. Uh, can I have the next slide, Aksha, please? So uh, because we are talking about alternative model systems in uh, biomedical research and uh, how zebrafish becomes uh, uh, relevant over here, of course, when you talk about alternative model systems, we always talk about three Rs. Uh, so we know that um, three Rs stand for replacement, reduction, and refinement. So now zebrafish uh, basically um, fits in in all of these three. Uh, when you talk about replacement, um, you can actually use the larval fish. Um, the embryonic stage of zebrafish completes by 72 hours. So from 72 hours to about one month of age uh, is considered as the larval stage of zebrafish. So you can actually use them to replace uh, the animals that are used in toxicity studies. Reduction, of course, um, you can use this same larval fish as a first style model. So you can reduce the use of uh, mammalian system um, for toxicity studies and for drug screening. Um, and refinement, of course, um, you can 
use fish to refine your experiments in such a way that you can use a very non-invasive approach. As I go with my slides, you will understand how zebrafish is a very uh, useful model uh, when someone is trying to do a non-invasive approach in screening, in imaging, in understanding the development of organs and so on. Can I have the next slide, please? So these are the two important people who have made zebrafish popular. And uh, the fact that all biomedical research institutes or universities in the country have zebrafish in their portfolio, uh, basically uh, thanks to these two people. Joss uh, Strensinger is the first person actually who started, who actually showed uh, the life stages of zebrafish and the handbook that we have. He's uh, almost called as the founding father of zebrafish uh, developmental and genetic research. He is the one who first started uh, uh, zebrafish uh, research as a, as a model for development of biology. Um, and all these stages have been identified by him. The person down below is uh, a very well-known name in Drosophila research. Uh, she is uh, Christian uh, Nussin Bollard. She is a Nobel laureate. Uh, she won her Nobel Prize for her research on uh, Drosophila, but she has also pioneered zebrafish research, uh, particularly in forward genetic screening using um, DNA screening. She is presently uh, a scientist emeritus in Max Planck University in uh, Germany. So she is the, uh, the, uh, the person who has brought zebrafish into the field of uh, genetic research. Uh, Akshat, please, the next slide. Akshat, can you have the next slide? So, uh, what are the qualities uh, that make zebrafish a preferred choice? So these are uh, the major ones. Of course, they have small size, so you don't have to worry about a big space to house them. High fecundity. The word fecundity means the ability of the female to lay eggs. Uh, high fecundity means uh, a particular female can uh, lay a large number of eggs at one spawn. The third property is probably the most important one, and I did touch upon this when you talked about refinement. Transparency of the embryos. So they are uh, totally transparent, so you can actually see the embryonic development uh, from outside. All you need is a good quality microscope and a lot of patients. Uh, when you put them under the microscope, you can see the almost all the uh, development of almost all the major organs. It's utero development. The eggs are laid outside, the fertilization happens externally, so the development is outside the body. Short generation time, within 72 hours, the embryogenesis is complete. Within three months, uh, the, uh, the juveniles are sexually adult, uh, so you have a very short generation time for a system which is a vertebrate but non mammalian uh, In your field, particularly those who are working in pharmacology, I think this particular uh, property is very, very important. They are amenable to HTS. HTS, as we all know, stands for high throughput screen. You can do, um, as you do in a cell line system, you can do with, uh, uh, you know, a zebrafish uh, in the same setup, uh, and you can actually screen large compounds, large number of compounds in a relatively very short time. And the, finally, the setup cost. Now the setup cost is probably one tenth of what you would spend on a mice or a, a rodent system. So uh, quite cheap compared to uh, uh, the higher animal systems. Uh, next slide, uh, Akshay. So these are some of the developmental landmarks of zebrafish. As you can see, as I mentioned already, hatching stage is uh, 72 hours. That is where embryonic development complete. Uh, these are some of the major landmarks, and these are also associated with uh, uh, assessing developmental defects or teratogenic defects of certain compounds. Can I have the next slide? Sure. So these are some of the stages. As I mentioned, the fossil stage is about one hour. You can um, see them all from outside. These are all taken with a good stereo microscope. You can see uh, the fossil stage. You can see the eight cell. The sphere is about four hours after fertilization. Uh, shield stage where you actually know the uh, dorsoventral patterning of the embryo. 90% epiboly is about nine hours post-fertilization. 
you can actually see the blastomere covering the entire yolk and a small opening is there at the bottom, which is shown here as a yolk plug. And at uh, 11 or 10 hours post fertilization, you would know uh, how the, the animal is shaping up, where the eye is going to come in, where the head is going to form. Um, the point that is shown on the image is the high primordium or the, uh, the, the analog of the eye, you can say, and the somites, which are the, basically the muscles. Uh, you can actually count the muscles and three somite stage, basically uh, three segments, muscle segments coming up at that stage. And 18 somite is almost a miniature adult. Um, and this is about 18 years. These are important landmarks that we generally uh, observe when we look at uh, certain uh, teratogenic effects. Uh, next slide, uh, Akshay. So uh, day one is um, uh, the stage where we have all the major organs developed, uh, particularly for the brain. Uh, 24 hours is necessary for the brain to develop completely. Uh, and the brain is shown here in this image. You have uh, all the three uh, parts of the brain completely developed to the forebrain, the midbrain, the height brain. You have the notochord coming up. Notochord is your feature, uh, the vertebral, uh, the vertebra. Somites are the muscles. Um, you have, when you see it day one, and if you look at day two and day three and day five, you can see how the patterning has changed, how the morphology has changed, how the pigmentation pattern has changed. Um, it's quite uh, amazing to see all of these. You can actually track them uh, with a simple uh, stereo microscope and a good camera that has the ability to record the video. So uh, if you see day one, day two is the stage where you look at the heart development. Day three, uh, you can see uh, how the yolk is get, getting absorbed. Initially, it is roundish in shape and then it becomes slender. And by day five, you can see the swim bladder coming up. You can see the intestine there. You can have the liver uh, forming quite easily. Um, so these are some of the stages uh, which are, again, important uh, developmental landmarks. Uh, next slide, Akshay, please. Now, the, here is a video of a zebrafish uh, embryo development from one cell stage up to uh, day four or day five. Can you just play the video? Uh, you just play, uh, just enter the video. Will play. Akshat, can you just press enter? I'm doing it. It's not working? Okay, never mind. Go to the next slide. Okay, okay. Now, now it should work. Yeah, you can see this is what some of the uh, developmental landmarks that I showed in the previous image. All of these are shown here. You can have the one uh, 1000 cell stage. You can see uh, probably uh, this is uh, somewhere at the shield stage that is coming up. Uh, this is about uh, seven to eight hours post fertilization. You can have the, now this is the, the, the probably um, the, Three somite stage coming up. Yeah, this is the three somite stage as you see here. And now the dorsoventral uh, patterning is coming up. You have the eye formed over there. You know which part of the body is going to be the dorsal side and the lateral side. Uh, you can have the, and now you see the body taking its shape. This is about uh, 24 hours from uh, the fertilization. You have the, the body becoming slender. And uh, this is about you can see the pigmentation pattern coming up. Um, you can see this is about 48 hours post fertilization. And now the eye is completely developed and uh, the circulation has set in. And you can see the heart already beating. Um, and then I sh you should be able to see the mouth forming very soon. Um, on the left hand side, you can just see below the eye, there will be a small protrusion that will be the mouth of the fish. Uh, that will come up by 72 hours. And once that is formed, it is a free swimming larvae. It will start looking for food. Uh, you can see the mouth now. You can very easily see the mouth formation. And now it is a free swimming larvae. So for the vertebrate, this is extremely rapid. And as I mentioned, it occurs ex utero outside the body and each stage is transparent. Uh, next slide, uh, Akshay. Now, when you talk about the use of zebrafish in human research or biomedical research, one must uh, understand what is the similarity. Now, 
as we know, of course, there has been an event of gene duplication in zebrafish. So we do have situations where uh, a particular gene is present in both copies. But if you look at the major genes and the major organs, more or less, they are uh, identical. And if you look at overall similarity, about 70% of the genes are uh, structurally and uh, uh, you know, functionally conserved in terms of their um, uh, you know, um, sequence information and their function. And if you focus mainly on the disease causing genes or the genes that are associated with human diseases, you have almost 80% uh, similarity. Of course, you can't uh, look at the um, research involving say lungs, because they of course, uh, the gills uh, perform the role of the lungs. And because they are non-mammalian, you cannot look at, uh, uh, say, for example, someone looking at a breast cancer, uh, probably they will not be able to look at the cancer development per se. But if you're looking at, um, say, BRCA genes, you can actually study the role of BRCA genes in um, homologous recombination in double standard DNA repair. And you can uh, find out uh, whether there is a structural similarity or a sequential uh, identity in, in zebrafish. So these are some of the things that are, um, there are, of course, uh, there are certain uh, demerits, but overall, I think they are uh, quite similar to human beings. Next slide, please. So what are the major applications in uh, biomedical research? So if you have to list it out, I think uh, there are four major applications. First one is toxicology, second one is pharmacology, third one is functional genomics, and the fourth one is disease modeling. Since I'm speaking to an audience, which is primarily uh, from a pharmacology or a toxicology background, uh, I will restrict more on these two important applications and I will briefly touch upon functional genomics. I'm running, of course, I'm running late, so I'll have to uh, make it quick. Next slide, uh, Akshat. So now if we talk about toxicology or the toxic effect of any drugs or a pesticide or a pollutant or a nanoparticle, whatever you can think of. Uh, if you see these three slides, three images over here, the left hand, left hand, uh, the most, uh, the left hand um, image, which is marked as um, uh, A, is uh, unexposed. And if you see the middle image and the, 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 the image on the extreme right is um, uh, B and C. Even if you're not a zebrafish expert, even if you have not seen a zebrafish embryo, uh, you will be able to tell you that uh, uh, the one that has been treated or the image that is shown in C the compounds that are given in C is extremely toxic because you don't see any development. You just see a coagulated mass, which is uh, means, which is uh, highly toxic and highly, um, uh, you know, uh, interfering with the development. And if you see the image at B, you see some of them are okay, but some of them have gross developmental anomalies or defects. So that means uh, there are, this particular compound is probably affecting um, with the development, early development stages. And the one that is there on the extreme right, definitely it is uh, toxic. So uh, such simple observations actually can give you a lot of information on the kind of drugs that you are dealing with or the kind of compound that you're dealing with. Of course, zebrafish is not going to replace your mammalian system. No one, no one claims that zebrafish can replace a mammalian system, but definitely it can serve as an intermediate or a first tier organism where you can get rid of certain potential uh, harmful uh, compounds, or in, in scientific terms, we call them as unwanted liabilities. If you get rid of these, something which is toxic in fish definitely is going to be toxic in higher animal. So by this, by this particular simple visual observation, you can uh, actually start, instead of starting with thousand compounds in a mouse or a um, uh, rodent model, you can start with uh, 10 of them. 990, you can screen fish and you can find out whether they are toxic or not. Next slide, please. So now all of you, I'm sure those who are into pharmacology or toxicology, you know this uh, database, CTD database, which is the comparative toxicogenomic database. So basically it, it, it compares the toxicogenomics, how a particular toxin influences the genomics. And till sometimes back, zebrafish was not included as a model system but now it is included. Uh, of course, if you search uh, for any particular toxic effect of any particular drug or a compound, either natural or synthetic, it will give you the details on which are the organisms that it has been tested on. 
and you will invariably find um, a, in addition to mouse and uh, rat and any other higher organism, you'll also find DNA radio there. So that means uh, people are appreciating uh, the usefulness of the system. Next slide, um, uh, Akshat. So now this is, uh, this is a data from 2018, uh, 2020 paper, basically. Uh, this is just to tell you that uh, there was a trend on the use of zebrafish in either toxicity studies or you're looking at uh, organ specific toxicity or you are people, people when people are trying to understand the mechanisms involved in toxicity. And you, you see the graph is upward from 2007 to 2018. If you see the data, the green bars are all with zebrafish study and the uh, orange bar is a uh, toxicity study. Uh, next slide, uh, Akshay. So uh, just to tell you about uh, how do we understand toxicity. So when you talk about the toxicity studies, we basically um, talk about um, you know how uh, toxicity could be a, a drug induced toxicity, or it could be a effect of a, a particular compound which has the potential good effects, but um, you know in in the in vitro it shows a very good uh, potential. But you know when you put it in a model system you see all kinds of unwanted effects. And when you talk about failures, I'm sure all of you know about thalidomide. I don't have to explain to this crowd or this audience because, you know, thalidomide has been, was, was a wonder drug. Um, you know, um, it was quite promising, um, uh, particularly for the pregnant, pregnant women uh, to treat morning sickness, but then it ended up with uh, the symptom called focomalia which um, basically uh, all these uh, majority of these women who uh, were treated with, uh, uh, they had um, either 40% in fact died during infancy and those that were born, they had this focomalia. So basically uh, absence of upper limbs and uh, stunted growth and um, a very <clears throat> stunted lower limbs and uh, uh, a seal-like appearance that was there for these um, you know, babies. Now, uh, why I'm talking about thalidomide? Next slide, um, Akshay. So thalidomide was considered as a wanted drug, but then it was removed from the market because of high excessive toxicity and uh, unwanted side effects. Now, this is a proof of principle. Uh, if you treat zebrafish with thalidomide, so what would you expect if it were to be looking at the, if it were to be interfering with the same pathway as it was seen in, in human beings, it would probably look uh, maybe having the same effect. So the answer is yes. When you treat zebrafish with thalidomide uh, or its partner protein, which is CRBN in human beings, you can actually see the, the image that you see on the right hand side, uh, those uh, pectoral fins, which are uh, analogous to uh, say limbs, upper limbs in mammalian system, you see the absence of those limbs. So that means the thalidomide is actually uh, interfering in the same pathway that you see in human being. So that is a proof of principle that such studies can be very effectively undertaken in a system like a fish. Next slide, uh, uh, Akshat, next slide please. So what are the advantages? So when you have, um, so again, with this crowd, I don't have to explain what is ADME. I'm sure you read, um, um, you know, quite extensively all these uh, aspects of a drug. Uh, so ADME kinetics um, is very important uh, to determine its usefulness or its um, ineffectiveness as a drug. So when you're talking about ADME kinetics, zebrafish has um, a lot of advantages. Um, you can have, uh, uh, you can prioritize the drug candidates. As I already mentioned, you can potentially eliminate these unsafe compounds. You can reduce unnecessary cost because uh, imagine uh, the cost that would be involved in doing, say, screen of thousand chemicals in a mice system compared to ten in a mice system. And uh, as I also uh, mentioned earlier it can serve as an intermediate step or a first step where you can uh, 
do a cell line study, an in vitro study, then you do an in vivo study, and then finally, you can only take up those which are promising and which are potentially good, and then you look at them in an animal system, in a mammalian system. Next slide, uh, So when you talk about, uh, I think it's taking a lot of time. Okay. So when you talk about the toxicity, um, so these are, uh, so if you look at the toxicity, generally you can do it either at a larval stage or you can do it in adult stage, depending on the need. Suppose you are developing a, uh, a drug for a pediatric application for children. Um, so obviously you should be looking at what are the effects at the larval stage because that is something that needs to be looked at. Suppose there is a drug which is uh, generally used for uh, a, a, a condition which shows up later in life, uh, probably then you can use an adult system to look at uh, toxicity. Now, almost all the organ uh, which are generally checked for uh, in a mammalian system, the same things can be checked in zebrafish as well. You can look at uh, neurotoxicity, you can look at ocular toxicity, intestine, pancreas, hepatobiliary toxicity, nephrotoxicity, endocrine toxicity, hematologic, and so on, cardiovascular toxicity, and so on. Uh, so there are quite a few, but in general, there are, next slide, uh, next slide, please. There are four major uh, assays that are generally uh, you know, used. So the first one is, of course, the developmental toxicity. Second one is the cardiotoxicity or cardiovascular toxicity. The third one is hepatotoxicity or effect on the liver development. And the fourth one is, of course, the neurotoxicity. In some cases, nephrotoxicity is also done. Uh, but uh, initially, when uh, we undertake uh, toxicity profiling of a particular compound, either natural or synthetic, we generally do this for, in a period of five days, means five days post fertilization, and we look at about 28 to 29 parameters. And for each parameter, we look at whether the effect is lethal or whether it is sublethal. So lethal means, of course, you are, uh, you know, uh, you are looking at, you're recording the death of the organism. Sublethal, you are looking at developmental or morphological deformities. Can we have the next slide, Akshay? Okay, so now day one, uh, when you look at the teratogenic effect, when you look at the developmental stages, day one is the first, uh, you know, important landmark. And uh, day one, I already showed you as uh, image before, um, uh, the brain development is complete. So suppose someone is looking at a drug uh, which is expected to have effects in the brain. So I think if someone is using zebrafish, this is the stage that they should look at. Now, uh, can you press enter, uh, Akshay, just press enter. So if you look at the heartbeat, it shows up at 22 HPF. Can you see that video where the heart is beating? Um, just next to the eye, there is a small beat that is going on. If you focus your attention onto the video, there is a heartbeat. So by 22 hours, you see the development. <coughs> press, press enter, uh, Akshay. So what are the toxicological endpoints? So you have as I mentioned, either lethal, lethal would be coagulation, means uh, no development at all, non-formation of somites, so the muscle development is completely perturbed, and non-detachment of the tail. When you saw that video where the body was single cell and then it was taking the shape of an uh, animal and then the tail was detached at some point of time, say at 18 hours after fertilization. Now, if the tail is not detached, that is uh, definitely interfering with development. So non-detachment of tail is probably um, considered as a lethal phenotype. So it's not going to survive. Sublethal malformation of the brain, malformation of the otoliths, of the eyes, of the tail, of the somite, notochord, and so many. Yolk sac extension. Uh, next slide, Akshay. One example that you can see here in the next slide, it's shown over here. You are just looking at simple visual observation. Of course, you need to do a little bit of standardization what is uh, the, you know, LC50 determination is done generally, but even then, I mean, the visual observation is more than enough to give you an idea. Over here, you have 
and untreated and you have two say, uh, for example, hypothetically speaking, there are two components. One is A and the other one is B. And you're looking at the brain development and the uh, tail um, effect on the tail. So if you see uh, it to be an ex a zebrafish expert, you can just see that, uh, you know, B is very close to the untreated one. But if you look at the A, there is a, some sort of cloudiness. The, 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 the brain development is not very clear. You don't see those demarcations of the midbrain and the hindbrain and the forebrain. It is all cloudy appearance. It is all coagulated kind of thing. So that means this particular compound is having an effect on the brain development. Same time, if you look at the tail, if you see the untreated and the, the one which is below at uh, say compound treated with B, the trail is generally straight, but here it is a little kinked in the sense it has a small bend. So that means probably it is a big effect on the notochord development or the future vertebra development. So could be that there could be a, you know effect on the bone development or maybe an effect on the nerve development at a later stage. Next slide, okay. So now that was uh, at day one. So if you want to look at a cardiotoxicity, suppose we, you want to see whether the compound has an effect on heart uh, development, the heart formation, the loop formation. Zebrafish heart is uh, identical to human heart. Only thing is uh, human heart has four basic, uh, four compartments, zebrafish has two compartments, but rest of the functions are almost identical. Now the major organ that we see at 42, 48 hours. That means two days after the embryo is fertilized, after the egg is fertilized, after the embryo is born. So 28, 48 hours is the, the organ where is the, is the stage where you look at our development. Uh, please enter. So this is uh, the simple circulation pattern of zebrafish. The red one is taking the pure blood. The blue line is take, bringing back the unpure blood. So it has just two major uh, circulation pattern. One is the artery and the other one is the vein. So the heart pumps out the blood through the lateral dorsal artery, and then it goes to the common cardial, uh, you know, dorsal, uh, common cardial vein, and then it goes all the way through the dorsal artery, then it goes all the way to the tail and it takes a turn down at the back. Uh, so that, and those that DA, the mark which is shown as DA, that is a dorsal artery. And then you have something marked as ISV. ISV is, uh, uh, is the full form of, uh, the full form of ISV is intersegmental vessels. These are the vessels that take the blood to other organs. And then goes all the way to the caudal artery. And then it comes back with the caudal vein and then comes back with the posterior caudal vein. And then the blood, blood the, the impure blood flows into the heart through this uh, common cardial vein, or it's also called as uh, duct of Cuvier. It flows in the form of a uh, kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a uh, you know, waterfall kind of thing. Just press enter, uh, Akshay. Yeah. I don't know if the video is clear. Uh, if you see the heartbeat, press enter again, Akshay. Akshay, press enter again. Yeah. You can see this, the common cardial vein or the duct of Cuvier. This is where the blood is coming. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, press enter, yeah. press again. Now, if you stick at the lower part, you can see the, uh, the, the blood going from the caudal artery and coming back with the caudal vein. That's a small video. Um, so this is very simple. Now, next slide. Okay. So uh, what are the toxicological impacts? Of course, if you're looking at a lethal toxic, lethal effect, uh, it is uh, no heartbeat. But if you look at the sublethal or teratogenic effect, it would be the malformation of the heart or it would be defective cardiac functions. So what are the defective cardiac functions? It could be uh, rhythmicity of the heart, it could be the heart rate, heartbeat, or it could be simply uh, the circulation pattern. The density of blood cells in circulation, for instance, could also be indicative of a defective heart function. Next slide. So again, here, uh, one snapshot of, again, you can see two compounds A and B. Even if you are not uh, working with zebrafish, if I'm showing you these three photos, uh, you can actually make out that the one in the middle is something wrong because there is a big uh, edema of the heart or the fluid accumulation, pericardial accumulation of fluid that is coming in there. 
uh, and the and and the, the upper one and the lower one seems to be normal. Next slide. Again, there is a small video here. I hope it will work. Um, uh, this is uh, the one which is treated. You see the heartbeat is feeble and there's a huge accumulation of fluid. There is heart beating, but you can't make out. It is so feeble. On the right-hand side, it's a normal heartbeat, no pericardial edema, nothing. So the blood cells are flowing in properly. So that means this particular compound uh, definitely showing an effect on the heart. Next slide, Akshay. Now, day three is generally when you look at neurotoxicity. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, day three is the end of embryogenesis or what you call as uh, the, uh, the hatching period. So zebra, zebra fish embryo generally grow inside a protective covering, which is called the chorion. And all the development that they take place uh, is inside that chorion. Now at day three or towards the later part of day two, they break open this chorion, they come out of, on their own and they start looking for food. Now, the ability to break this chorion and come out on their own is known as hatching efficiency. So basically, if this event is not happening properly, then there is uh, uh, some sort of indication that it could be interfering with the development. So two things could happen either premature hatching, that means they are coming out before uh, the scheduled uh, uh, you know, developmental uh, stage, or they're not able to come out at all. Now, this the image shown on the left, they are all three days old embryos. Almost all of them are inside the chorion. They are not able to come out. But if you see on the right-hand side, all of them have come out. They are all perfect. They are now swimming. Uh, freely swimming. So if such a thing happens, this could be also an indication of a developmental defect. So this can also be included in toxicity studies. Next slide. So uh, the last one is, of course, the hepatotoxicity that we look at, the effect on the liver, because liver is one of the late developing organs. And by day five, the liver development is complete. Where the liver is, actually, you can see in this image. Uh, press enter, Akshay. Okay. Now, if you uh, zoom it out, um, you have uh, the the liver shown here. You have the intestine, and uh, you have the big swim bladder that comes. In. Absence of swim bladder is also considered an important, uh, you know, developmental defect in fish. Uh, press enter again. There is a video again. Um, Akshat, can you press enter? Yeah. Now, uh, press play the video. Yeah. You can see the peristaltic movement of the gut. Can you see the gut movement? Uh, it is something similar to human gut movement. Absolutely identical. So, if you see, uh, uh, press play it again. Akshat, yeah, it again. Yeah. You can see the heartbeat. You can see the peristaltic movement of the gut and you can see the liver just next to it. Now, if there are some anomalies in this gut associated organs, development of this gut associated organs, of course the pancreas is up, the kidney is just above the swim bladder, but we are not able to focus here. We are focusing only the major organ. Next slide, Akshat. So if there are any problems over there, you can, it, it's very easily um, visible. Now, of course, there is no uh, lethal effect associated with hepatotoxicity. It's only with some lethal effect. So you can have a visual assessment of the liver necrosis. And as I also, also mentioned, if the gut-associated organs are not developed, come to there. And the other important aspect is whether the yolk, which is the major source of energy for them. Zebra fish does not need any uh, feed for uh, five to seven days. They can survive. Without feed. Of course, they start looking for food on third day, but they can survive without food quite comfortably. And the source of energy is the yolk. So, as the yolk gets absorbed, it uh, comes um, back in its shape. It becomes slender and slender, and then it uh, takes the shape. All the gut associated organs show up there. So, if the yolk consumption is inhibited, that is also considered a toxicological impact. Next slide, Akshay. So 
so uh, so this is again uh, one uh, on the left hand side is a is, is, a, is, a, is a, a fish which is treated with some compound right hand side is an untreated one and you see this brown coloration this darkening of the liver which is indicative of a necrosis so this is visual observation you don't even have to do oil bed staining you don't even have to do any other biochemical parameters you just look at it and you can make out that there is a problem with the liver development so it is as simple as that next step So neurotoxicity and behavioral response, we do it at day three. Some of the ways that one can do is uh, shown here. So there is something called zebra box, is basically an automated system which tracks the movement of the fish or the larvae uh, inside a chamber. And you can put them in a microwave plate and you can put in different uh, uh, concentration organs in different concentrations. Um, you can uh, track the movement. So these are, uh, and this movement is uh, captured by a camera and it shows out as a uh, graphical output uh, from this uh, instrument. Now, the green lines that you see, these are the slow movement of the larvae. The red lines are the rapid movement or the fast movement. So by just looking at this, you can actually look at whether the compound is probably affecting the behavior of the, of the fish. Uh, this is generally uh, done in this. This instrument is available. It costs about 15 to 20 lakhs. You can actually do a very nice study. In fact, um, there are some people in India, they have developed something similar. Uh, I think I remember one university in Punjab, they have developed uh, something, uh, a very uh, indigenous system to track uh, the movement of fish. And they are working on some, uh, you know, neuro, neuro related drugs. So, uh, this is uh, there are many different kinds of uh, systems available. Next slide. So I'll show you a video about um, this touch response. So zebra fish, uh, if you at this is a day uh, two or day three embryos, so they have this touch response or escape response. So what basically it means is when you touch the tip of the free swimming larvae with any object, they have this immediate escape response. Uh, uh, Akshat, can you play the video on the left hand side? On the right hand side, right, right hand side, right hand side, yeah. Okay, now this is, I'm touching, this is my own video. You see this, these are untreated ones. No, no, no. Uh, can you stop the left hand one, please? Let only the right hand ones uh, play, and then you play the right, left one, thank you. So if you touch this at the tip, uh, it will quickly move away from the focus area. So it's called escape response. And this is a, a normal uh, behavior of zebra fish. If you just uh, see, there are a couple of them here. Um, so you can um, just touch again, I'm touching it with a simple capillary, one mm capillary, I'm just giving the touch at the tail and they're quickly swimming away. So, uh, So all of them have this uh, escape response. Okay, I, I think it's over. Now you play the left hand side. Now this is, you can imagine if this is treated with any organ or any, any, any compound, any, any, any uh, 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 you know, compound or any uh, nanoparticle or whatever. See, if you're touching, but they're not moving away from the focus, they're all there. It's, it's, they're giving a twitching movement. If you see the twitching movement, yeah. So they are unable to swim away from this. So this defective motility, uh, next slide, uh, Akshay. And uh, this defective motility and the touch response is also linked to their neurological behaviors. And of course, uh, these standard techniques like genotoxicity, oxidative stress, and cytotoxicity, these things are generally people do at um, in vitro system. You can do all of these in uh, the fish model. For example, your antioxidant pathway, which is quite um, conserved in fish, you can do all these uh, assays. You can also look at them in real time. Next slide, please. You can do an, uh, re uh, you know, real time PCR. You can actually look at the expression of certain, um, uh, you can measure the reactive oxygen species in, in real time by in vivo using live animal, you can do this. So basically you have the embryos, you expose them to a particular compound and then you put this H2DCFDA 
which is um, uh, a marker of, um, you know, which tracks uh, these, uh, the reactive oxygen species generation and the, you observe them under frozen microscope. So the process of oxidation com converts this, uh, the non-frozen form into frozen form. Uh, uh, and uh, this is indicative of the level of oxidation uh, that is happening. Next slide, Akshay. So if you see here, these are all treated, these are all uh, zebrafish embryos treated with arsenic and arsenic is known to cause uh, oxidative stress. And as you increase the concentration, you see enhanced uh, expression of uh, these uh, compounds. So that means, um, you know, uh, the reactive oxygen species generation is, uh, you can track this, you can monitor it real time. Uh, next slide. Okay, presenter. So, uh, so, so far we have talked about the toxicology and uh, how a drug induced toxicity can be done. Next part of uh, this is the usefulness of zebra fish in drug discovery. Next, press enter. Next slide. So when you talk about drug discovery, you basically have, um, you know, uh, the standard protocol, you look at the bioactivity, you look at toxicity and you look at off-target effects. And then based on that, you identify the lead compound and then you go ahead with the process of drug development. Next slide, Akshay. So in drug development, of course, we know there are two ways of drug development. One is target-driven, the other one is phenotype-driven. Now, the target-driven is basically you identify the target and then you screen for compounds which can go and bind to the target and then it leads to the identification of the lead compound and then you go in for structure based design and then you have uh, in vitro system validation and then you know uh, pharmacokinetics in animal model then you'd go for a human trial and then into the clinic so it takes about 10 to 12 years or generally 15 years target driven slightly longer now the the other way of doing it is a phenotype driven and that's why zebrafish uh, becomes very useful in phenotype driven you don't go for the target, you look at the phenotype. Suppose I'm developing a drug that can be used for treating anemia in patients. So my phenotype would be a zebra fish, which is showing anemia. I'm not really bothered about whether the anemia is caused due to uh, defective ribosome red blood cell synthesis or because of B12 deficiency or any iron deficiency or so on. Uh, I'm focused on uh, the look at this phenotype, whether any compound can rescue this phenotype in fish. What do you mean by rescue of the phenotype? So basically you create a system where the zebra fish is anemic and how you look at the anemia, you look at the hemoglobin staining or you stain the red blood cells. And you treat these animals with a battery of compounds. Any compound that can increase red blood synthesis is potentially uh, a compound that can be treated, that can be used for treating patients with any. So basically over there, you generally look at the red blood cells. So this approach is slightly different. Look at the phenotype first, and then you screen for compounds that can uh, alleviate or that can uh, rescue that from And then of course you identify lead compound and then the rest of the things are same. So this process takes a little less time and uh, whatever discoveries that have happened in zebrafish uh, through this one. Next slide, please. So, uh, so how you actually use zebrafish in drug discovery? Next slide. Uh, Now this is of course a, 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 a image of a study that came up in Embor also. It's a little old paper, but this is, uh, they have identified uh, the target and they've also looked at the protein that comes. Now, high throughput screening, as I mentioned, one of the um, good features of zebrafish, um, it enables zebrafish, um, it enables screening of large number of uh, compounds at one go. Now, all of you probably, you study about HDS technology in your, uh, curriculum. So basically, it's an automated technique. As we know, uh, it can uh, allow you to screen a large number of compounds at a completely automated system. Um, 
zebra fish can uh, be very easily used. In fact, 96 well plates, you can put up, up to 50 microliter of your uh, embryonic medium or your water or whatever compound that you want to dissolve in. Uh, you can leave them for seven days without any change of water, without any change of compound. You can just look for the, uh, the rescue of the phenotype. Nowadays, people are even using 384 well plates and 1536 well plate generally can put about maybe 5 microliter, 10 microliter of a solution in that. And even in that, you can put uh, one or two uh, uh, simple, uh, you know, uh, smaller um, uh, zebra fish, say at 10 hours uh, post fertilization or about 18 hours post fertilization. So this is, okay, next slide. So how do, what does zebra fish bring in there? What is the advantage of zebra fish in this? So it combines two things. Uh, one is it allows you to do a whole animal-based assay. So you're not just looking at a cell line, you are looking at the entire animal. And it also allows you to scale it up to a level where you can do it with cell lines. So it allows the scalability of the in vitro system because the in vitro system also uses 96 cell plates, 384 well plates, you can use the same setup. Uh, this is actually an image of a 96 well plate taken from top. And in each one, you can see about three or four zebra fish embryos put in there. And they are four days old embryos. So they're quite big. Now, what are the advantages? As I mentioned, they can survive without food for seven days. They're just few millimeters. So you can just put them very easily. Uh, the best part is they're tolerant to DMSO. So almost all the formulations, whatever the extracts or compounds that you deal with, generally you dissolve in DMSO. So zebra fish do not, DMSO doesn't have any, um, you know, uh, adverse effects on uh, the zebra fish development. And of course, if you're dealing with adults, you can treat them. Uh, you can have intraperitoneal injection, you can have cardiac injections and so on. Next slide. So advantages, you can have, because of the optical transparency, you can look at the expression of expression patterns of genes and proteins. Please remember, I'm talking about the phenotype driven discovery. So obviously all these advantages help in identifying what are the best ways of looking at whether the phenotype is rescued or not. Tracing of xenografts, I'll spend five minutes on this, which is a very important application of fish in cancer research. And of course, I also already mentioned it is a, your readouts, whatever you read out, you are talking about whole organism based readout. You're not looking at a single cell, you're looking at the entire animal. And if you're talking about a disease like cancer, um, you already know that it is a crosstalk between different cells, it's a crosstalk between cells and extracellular matrix, and it involves a whole niche. It doesn't, it doesn't work in a single uh, single cell, or it is not a 2D system, it's a 3D system. Next slide. Yes. So what all you can do, you can look at uh, antibody staining, you can do an inside your hybridization, you can look at close importers and so on. Okay, next slide. We'll just give you some examples. We'll run through, run through this quickly. Uh, these are some of the examples. If you're looking at a brain-specific marker, you can just uh, stain the embryos with Crocs 20. We can give you an idea about whether the um, uh, it is a um, uh, you know a hindbrain specific one. If you look at uh, all the parts of the brain, you can stain them with Pax6. If you do a ubiquitous gene expression, you can look at a ubiquitous gene expression. If you look at say uh, specific to cell lines and uh, blood cells, you can look at a GATA expression. Next slide. Uh, you can look at antibody staining. This is phosphohistone staining in zebra fish, which is a mitotic marker. If you're looking at um, cells, uh, if you're looking at a compound which is uh, mitogenic in nature, you can just do a phosphohistone staining and it can give you an idea whether it is including, it is uh, making it um, um, mitogenic or not. Next slide. You can do a tunnel assay, which is for apoptosis. You can do uh, hemoglobin staining, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can do that. You can look at the red blood cell marker. Very simple, for example, hemoglobin staining just takes 15 minutes. All you have to do is you take advantage of this ODA system, uh, which uh, in, uh, in presence of peroxide, hydrogen peroxide 
hemoglobin allows this catalytic activity of hemoglobin allows this conversion of ODA into chromogenic substance. Similarly, in tunnel assay, I'm sure all of you know about uh, tunnel assay where the single standard DNA mix are labeled. You can have either a streptavidin labeled system, you can have, or you can have a fluorescent tag. You can just look at a um, you know, fluorescent system and look at this uh, apoptotic cells. Very easy to do. Next slide. So now genomic manipulation tools, uh, of course, with um, uh, the, the discovery of uh, all kinds of genomic tools that we have at disposal, I think uh, the, one of the important aspects of this uh, lecture series is about transgenic systems. Now you can look at zebrafish as an ideal model system where you can do transgenesis very effectively. Um, you can use um, the TOL2 system, you can use uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9, you can use the, uh, the sleeping beauty system, you can have all kinds of things that can be done. You can have over expression of mRNA, you can have a, a tail ends or zinc finger nucleases or morpholinos or CRISPR to knock down or to knock out a gene. You, of course, morpholino um, it has been used extensively, but more and more uh, the use is getting limited because of severe uh, off-target effects and a lot of stringent control that is required. But with the CRISPR-Cas9 coming in the field, people are hardly using morpholino anymore because CRISPR-Cas9 is so effective and very easy to do. So all kinds of genomic manipulation tools also allow zebrafish to become, um, you know, very useful in all kinds of uh, biomedical applications. ZERC, or uh, Zebrafish Information Resource Network, is the, the biobank of zebrafish biobank, you could say. And uh, as on probably three or four months back, there are 43,493 fish lines which are available. Uh, we, you can order them, you can buy them. These are generally maintained as frozen lines. They do an in vitro fertilization and uh, send across the embryos. Of course, there are certain restrictions of the customs, but things are more, more and more streamlined now. Uh, you can actually get these lines, you can grow them. Challenges to grow, uh, challenges to raise them. And if you have a good raising system, uh, you can actually grow them very easily. Next slide. So uh, one example in anti-cancer drug discovery, I will just quickly run through. Uh, just next slide. Uh, suppose someone is looking at a liver cancer drug. You are trying to develop a drug that can treat liver cancer. So what is the best approach? You can go the transgenesis approach. So what is that? Basically, you need to have a system where the liver is tagged. So you can have, uh, so for example, here, in this transgenic line, the liver is tagged with m -cherry. m -cherry is the reporter gene, uh, reporter protein. Uh, how you are tagging it, you are using, you are expressing m -cherry under the influence of a promoter, which is liver specific. Here, it is a liver specific fatty acid binding protein. So if you have the system, you can overexpress an oncoprotein. In this system, suppose you have a system, you overexpress KRAS in this. So definitely it will end up with heterocellular carcinoma. Now use this system, next slide. Now use this system to screen your anti-cancer drugs by HTS. Now you cross this uh, transgenic line, get the embryos. All these embryos will have fluorescent liver and you put them at day five or little later when the liver is completely developed, you would know. And because they are overexpressing oncoprotein, at some point of time, they will develop uh, heterocellular carcinoma, take them, put them in microdata plates and treat them with whatever compound that you want, either some functional ingredients or some chemicals or any biotech compound from somewhere. And then you observe for the rescue of these phenotypic uh, assessments. So what do you do phenotypically? You just look at the size of the liver, you look at the uh, modules that are formed in the liver. You can also do biochemical assays, you can do uh, immunocytochemistry for these markers. So parallelly, you would do something that are not treated and then you treat them and see whether there is a difference. And if there are, then of course, you are looking at an, uh, potential candidates. And if you see them, and then you can uh, find it out and you can have uh, plenty of, um, uh, you know, uh, good compounds which can be taken further. Next slide.
Similarly, you can screen for inhibitors of protein synthesis. The slides on top, uh, those green uh, signals that you're seeing, imagine these are uh, areas where nascent protein synthesis is happening. In fact, it is actually uh, uh, the areas that are marked. And zebrafish at this stage, head and eye, is the major uh, highly developing organ. So here, protein synthesis is happening. Suppose you want to use a drug that inhibits protein synthesis. That could be a potential anti-cancer drug because you know, as the cells are dividing rapidly, protein synthesis demand is more. So it's an indirect way of looking at uh, anti-cancer drug. So lower one, it is treated with something, and then you have a great reduction in this Alexa rated signal. So that means that maybe, maybe it is a good drug to deal uh, to, to to probe further to look into whether there is um, you know some sort of effect on actual protein synthesis. Next slide. You can also have inhibitors of apoptosis. So if you have, suppose you have, um, suppose you are looking at um, a drug that uh, is an anti-cancer, so obviously you need to uh, have a drug that can induce cell death. So left-hand side, you have more uh, TMR red signal compared to the right-hand one. So perhaps uh, the ones that are inducing um, uh, cell death could be a good potential uh, you know, uh, anti-cancer drug, which can be uh, uh, investigated further. Next slide. Prevention of angiogenesis or vasculogenesis is another way of indirect way of looking at anti-cancer development. Angiogenesis is at the last stage where you talk about metastasis of cancer. People die because of metastasis. People don't die because of primary uh, growth of cancer in a particular organ. Because organ transplant is possible, if that was the case, people can just replace that organ. But what is happening is people, because of the process of metastasis, uh, you know, it is not very easy to locate or to track how many cells are moving. And for metastasis to happen, angiogenesis should be happening. So if you can prevent angiogenesis, you can actually prevent metastasis. Or you can prevent the growth of the cancer in a secondary organ. So you can also screen for uh, compounds that can prevent angiogenesis. Now, of course, in this, you don't see a difference between these two. So your drug may not be uh, effective in this, for instance. But if you have a drug, um, those small lines that are going up, these are those intersegmental vessels that I showed. This is an in situ hybridization for flea. Flea is a transcription factor that is involved in vasculogenesis. So uh, like this, you can screen very easily uh, for compounds which uh, can have a good application. Next, next slide. So this is xenograft, uh, which is done in fish. Um, this is how you can do. You can take either human cancer cells and put them in uh, zebra fish and see whether they are able to migrate to different organs. If they are able to migrate, that means they are highly metastatic. If they are not, then they are probably, they do not have metastatic potential. You can, or, or you can put the zebra fish tumor cells from one cell into another mutant. The mutant is, uh, it's called Casper. So basically it is uh, devoid of all uh, pigments. Uh, just to track the movement easily, this uh, particular um, mutant is used. So you can do it at the adult stage or you can do it at the embryonic stage. Next slide. Now this is the future of uh, zebra fish xenograft research. So what you can do, uh, this is a paper that came last year. And now what it is saying is, as we have personalized, uh, you know, uh, chemotherapy profiling that is done for patients, cancer patients, the same thing you can do in zebra fish by using xenograft in the system. So as the, uh, the, the, the image is quite clear and self-explanatory, so you have different compounds. So first you take zebra fish, you inject them with patient cells, put them in different wells in the microdata plate, and then you treat each well with different drugs and see, and then you look for the viability screen. So the same patient cell in different zebra fish embryos treated with different drugs. Some of them will die, some of them will not die. So the ones that are dying, that means that particular drug is 
chemosensitive. That means it, it is able to, uh, you know, kill the cells. So that will give you an idea which are those uh, drugs that can be given for a particular patient. Of course, once you do that, then you look at orthotopic mouse models. You can confirm this in mouse system, and then finally you can do you know, clinical trials. So here you are looking at the tumor cell behavior, or how you look at the chemosensitivity. How you look at the chemosensitivity is by looking at whether it is able to proliferate, or whether it is able to prevent angiogenesis, whether it is able to migrate, or whether it is to able to metastasize. The other way of doing it is the next slide. Go to the next slide, Akshay. Yes. The other way of doing it is actually looking at the major problem is drug resistance or chemo resistance. What you do? Same thing. You take patient-derived tissue or you take cells from organoids or from tissue culture, wherever, or from uh, a mammalian system. You put them in zebra fish embryos. In the previous one, you are treating them with different drugs. In here, you are giving cells obtained from different sources, but you are giving a single drug. And you're looking at those, the ones that are able to withstand the effect of the drug. So the cells which are able to withstand, they are potentially drug resistant cells. Take them out. As you have put them in the fish, you can usually take them out. You can do, of course, you need to sacrifice the fish. You can do a cell sorting. Take those cells out, which did not die after giving that particular drug. Take it out and then characterize it. What is the mechanism of drug resistance? So this is another way of doing it in fish. And you can actually, people are following this strategy in, in identifying uh, what uh, would be the mode or how early a cancer cell can re become resistant to a particular uh, chemotherapeutic drug. Next slide. So we talked about so much of drug discovery. Uh, this is one example which uh, the discovery has happened in fish and this is actually being treated now. This is, this is being used now. It is used for treating umbilical cord blood with uh, uh, this DMPG2 uh, prior to transplant. So what it, what this drug does, it enhances hematopoietic stem cell development. And this helps. So when you are taking the umbilical cord blood, you can treat this and it enhances the capacity of this cord blood to have more uh, hematopoietic stem cells and then it can be given to the uh, uh, transplant patients. So this is being used uh, at the moment. Next slide. Now this I will skip because of paucity of time because I've already uh, crossed too much of time. I will move this uh, part. Maybe in some other uh, uh, context, some other time, I will talk about this. Can you just quickly go through, Akshay? Yeah. Next slide. Next. Okay, in disease modeling, um, go to the next slide. Of course, uh, 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 there is hardly any disease that has not been uh, modeled in zebrafish. Uh, everything has been modeled, including uh, insomnia, including drug addiction, cocaine addiction, everything has been done. Uh, so uh, disease modeling is a very, very big field. Uh, this slide is my journey. Uh, on a particular hematopoietic disorder that I work with. It is a pediatric bone marrow failure condition. We started in 2006, and uh, this is my journey. Till 2018, we have uh, published uh, work uh, where we have identified um, certain mechanisms. Whatever we have identified, all these are uh, the studies, uh, these are all based on studies that we did in zebrafish. 2006, we first published a paper. Again, it was a first report where we said uh, ribosomal proteins can be knocked down. 2008, we first we were the first to develop a DBA model. DBA stands for uh, diamond blackfin anemia. Um, the patients have a mutation in ribosomal proteins. 
uh, in 2009, uh, we showed the role of P53 in this uh, system. 2011, we showed that it is not only P53 in the ribosomal protein. In fact, that there is a role of, uh, there is a, a P53 independent pathway, which is also important. 2014, we said that uh, the role of P53 and the anemia is a common factor, not only for ribosomal proteins that are found to be mutated, but it is in fact common for all the ribosomal proteins. And in 2018, we showed the role of uh, an oncoprotein, which is called CMIC. Uh, and th there's a crosstalk between CMIC and P53, which is involved in DDA pathophysiology. Okay, next slide. So zebrafish, um, great potential, a lot of applications. Uh, there, are, there are wonderful um, you know, uh, work going on, um, but I don't say that uh, everything is good with zebrafish, there are limitations. Of course, there are any model system will have limitations, but one good thing is it can complement. It is not going to substitute an enabling system. Uh, nobody can watch for it. Um, there are limitations, yes, but it can complement a membrane system. And uh, some of the advantages, particularly in the disease that I worked with, in fact, zebrafish DBA model is a better model uh, than a mouse DBA model, because um, depending on the context, in some conditions, zebrafish models are better compared to the membrane system. And of course, we have more and more researchers and scientists appreciating the role of zebrafish in biomedical research. And that's why we have more and more people getting into zebrafish research. And once you get into it, it's, it's, it's a uh, fascinating world of dealing with live animals, looking at their eye development, looking at their gut development, looking at their uh, heart development and everything just by uh, observation. So uh, next slide, Akshay. So this is uh, it's taking a lot of time to show up. Okay. So this is my zebrafish team. Uh, of course, uh, not everyone is there in the picture, but uh, this is a recirculatory system that we even uh, installed last year. Um, uh, we have installed uh, this system. It is from Technipass. It's a complete recirculatory system, and these are some of the people who are involved in it. I have a whole lot of people to thank. Uh, uh, for, but um, here, um, first of all, I sincerely apologize for the uh, technical glitches that we had, but finally we could do it. Thanks to uh, my colleague Akshat uh, helping me out from uh, my room in, in uh, Mangalore. Thanks Akshat for uh, presenting it for me. And uh, thanks to Dr. Praveen and uh, Dr. Shivram for um, uh, inviting us, uh, and, and Anurag is presenting tomorrow, as I understand, inviting Nuxer, and they have been um, regular visitors to Nuxer, and uh, we look forward to welcoming more people from your institution, and it would be an honor and privilege to be associated with DSS at some capacity uh, in, in future as well. Thank you very much, everyone.